Um, Ray spent a lot of time talking about holistic, right? Hey, Bart. We've been trying to teach holistic beef production for a long time. Ray mentioned this Ray mentioned the IRM program. And of course, the IRM program is, uh, is all about looking at an entire beef operation to improve revenue and profitability. My topic today, I'm the animal science guy in a forage conference, so you know I'm the guy that sticks out a little bit here. And my topic is right-sizing your cows for profit. And really what I want to focus on is becoming more efficient. And efficient is a term that has been thrown around decades. Chris, I don't know how long, forever. At least as long as we've been in this business. And maybe, I'd be, I'd be honest with you, I haven't really seen efficiency or efficient defined very often. And so I just went to the dictionary. I don't think anybody has a dictionary anymore. We all do Dr. Google, right? But Webster's defines efficient as effective operation by measure of a comparison of production with costs. Okay, now that starts, Dr. Hallich, I know you're back there, that starts to sound like an economics term. Okay, and it is kind of an economics term, and that's really going to be how we focus on it. So the two parts of what we're going to talk about in my little discussion today is we're going to talk about both ends of that. We're going to talk about production, and we're going to talk about costs. And this is where we're going to talk about right-sizing our cows. For the production, that's my actual job, right? As the reproductive specialist, that's my actual job. And whether you're raising corn, beans, cattle, hogs, sheep, the more units you have to sell, the more likely you are to generate revenue, the more likely you are to generate profitability. And as the reproductive specialist, we really want to maximize or, or, or discuss with our clientele how to maximize weaning rate. We need a cow to calve every 365 days and every single day longer than the start of the calving season that she calves, it costs us more money. And actually there's a lot of research that shows about a nickel a head a day in cost of production increases the longer your calving season goes. Also, on the cost side, we cannot afford, particularly today, right, to feed open cows. And we certainly cannot afford to feed inefficient cows, and that's what we're going to talk about as we get through it. So the first step, and of course, you know, as the reproductive specialist, right, this is what I'm going to talk about is the first step, is we need to control reproduction. We need to control product. We usually start here, right, Bart? Did she get pregnant? But is that the important part? What's the important part? Got to have something to sell. Did she wean a calf? And we, we learn this sometimes the hard way, right? Because, David, we get out there and we, we, we breed those cows and we get them preg checked and we get 95% like, yeah, okay? And then we lose a few at calving, a couple of diet scours, Maybe something else odd happens here and there, and we don't get that calf weaned. We need her to wean a calf, okay? And so we really want to focus on that as one of our uh, uh, main criteria. What I really want to start pushing people to do is when will she calve? Will she calve in a time frame that will make you money? All right, well, to figure that out, we got to figure out how are you going to make money? Okay, if you're a freezer beef guy and you're selling, or gal, and you're selling freezer beef all throughout the year, do you need a controlled breeding and calving season? Nope. Because you want a constant supply of beef ready to go. But if you're selling feeder cattle and you're trying to group them together, okay, because we know with Dr. Hallich and Dr. Burdine's work from, what, Greg, 10 years ago? Five years ago, we know the more the bigger the lots you sell, the more likely you are to maximize value. If if you're selling in in lots, we need to make sure that we control when those cows calve. Okay, we get higher cost of production, we get lower value when we don't really control when they calve. Ray mentioned 
I, I, I calculated this for that uh, one award that I got this last year, and I've been on, I, I have averaged just a little bit over one farm visit per day of employment since 1997. And I'm on farms, David, you know, all the time. And when for us to be profitable, for the people here in our normal marketing and production situations, for us to be profitable, we can become profitable if we calve short, have a high pregnancy rate, a low calf death loss, and we wean greater than 88% of our cows that are exposed to the bull wean a calf. So that's what we're, we're going after. What tools can we use? The one that we don't talk about enough is the most important. Call. It amazes me how much better a herd gets when you call the junk off the bottom. Okay? All of a sudden, our, the ability of our cattle to get to, to produce and, and, and perform for us improve. But also, if we want to control when they get pregnant, we need to control when they come in heat. And if we want to control when they come in heat, we need to synchronize esters whether that's for natural service or AI. This is where we need to, we start looking at the holistic component of it because, you know, when you think about reproduction and maximizing weaning rate, okay, weaning percent, really reproduction's icing on the cake. But all that other cake, all those other ingredients that go into it is what, is what makes reproduction possible. And I hate starting off with nutrition, Dr. Lim Cooler, but sometimes I'm forced to, okay? We need to calve our cows at a body condition score of five or six, and I'll be honest with you, I like six because six is 95% preg rates and five is 85% preg rates. But we got to get them at condition score five to six and, and keep them there through the start of the breeding season. We need to have a quality mineral available daily and in our soil and, and with our forages, we need to really consider copper and selenium in organic forms in that mineral so that we can provide enough of those trace minerals for bioavailability. We got to vaccinate. Okay, say, well, okay, well, yeah, everybody vaccinates. No, everybody doesn't vaccinate. You know what happens quite a bit when we don't vaccinate? Cattle abort. Deer, and I, don't, we, I know we don't have any deer in Kentucky, so it's not a problem. But deer are vectors for BVD and lepto. And if your cattle have access to groundwater and they're not vaccinated, you will have problems. We've seen it all over, and it's a problem that we have uh, consistently in this state. I, re I like strategic deworming, so in other words, young, thin cows. And then, of course, I couldn't say this, have anything to do with uh, uh, an animal science talk if I didn't throw the word crossbreeding out. Dr. Lim Cooler, make sure Dr. Bullock knows that I threw that in there. We need to keep records because it's awfully difficult to identify where your holes in your system is if you're not keeping records. And then finally, we get to reproduction stuff. So this is like the seventh down the list, okay? Control estrus. Remove the bull at some point. Or preg check. You can keep the bull in there if you're preg checking and keeping a controlled breeding and calving season, right? Bob, you can do that. It's not, it's not exclusive. We can keep the bull in there if we need to, but we need to preg check. In particular, in really hot years like this year, we need to preg check. And then observe cows closely and make sure that those calves don't die uh, from disease. Now, what's an example of implementing a plan that discusses or, or implements all of those things? Bart Hamilton is a guy that's going to be talking a little bit later. This is from his farm, and he's going to augment some of these data with his forage uh, production. But this was Bart's system in March of 2015 when David and Bart had me come up there as part of the UK IRM farm program. This is the cows calving in each month, total number of cows. He calved over a 342 day window and marketed 13 calves out of 17 cows. Bart looked me in the eye, and I'll never forget it. 
He said, if you can't straighten out this cattle mess, I'm going to sell them all. Okay, and you'll hear from Bart in a, little, in a little while, pretty straightforward guy. First thing we did, Bart told me he wanted to calve in the fall, September and October. We sold a bull. Okay, that cow, we had a hard time uh, being mad at her because she calved both in January and December of that year. But it wasn't in the right time frame, so we ended up selling her. Held those for fall breeding. Held those for fall breeding. Sold one. Put a cedar in right before we turned the bull out on one. Sold one. Sold both of those. Sold both of those. Very heavy calling. Average cow size at that time was about 1,700 pounds. He had limousine cross cows. Not quite as easy to handle then as they are now either, by the way. We did call and replace aggressively over the next seven years, and we incorporated estrus synchronization and AI so we could make rapid genetic improvement in that herd. And this is what happened over this six year period, six or seven year period, I can't count very good. We took him from 342 days down to 60. He maintained that 50 to 60 day window until this cow messed us up, Bart. Should have sold her early so that we wouldn't have this, da this data. Uh, but it's still a 77-day window. Okay, his calf death loss has improved. But we're noticing some abortions. Okay, and we're, we're working hard to get that taken care of. Average cow size, size now is just under 1,300 pounds. Again, aggressive culling. Genetic selection to reduce cow size and maintain productivity. Bart has identified his target market, which is extremely important for us right now, and that he wants to sell seven to eight weight steers in August. This is his productivity differences. This is how we started. This is how we finished in total pounds, but you know, total pounds includes a, a, an increase in number of cattle. His efficiency, which does not, I mean, this is on a per cow basis, right? His efficiency has gone up extremely. He went from 311 pounds of calf wean per cow exposed to 561. You can calculate this stuff a million different ways. But down here, it all, it all turns up black. I've got it in red, but it turns up black. We're making more money, okay? Bart's evolving in his production situation. He's doubled his herd, and this is not uncommon, okay? As a matter of fact, nearly every single person we start with ends up increasing their cow herd quite a bit because we decrease the cow size and so we have the same nutrients Jim we have the same amount of nutrients same acres and we're able to increase the number of cattle that are on those on that at those acres he since he identified his market now what he wants to do is we want to raise steers eight weight steers in August so we're doing two rounds of AI using sex ordered semen okay and we're making efforts to get there. We, we, we are going to be 100% dedicated to it next year, but this year we did get about a 67% a steer ratio. This is a protocol that we use for two rounds of fixed timed AI. The only way that it was possible was that we were able to use a shoot side pregnancy detection that was developed by IDEX. Um, it's pretty cheap. It's not actually at Jeffers. I went to find it the other day. It's not there. We can do it as early as a day 28. It's not 100%, but it's really close, and it's simple as pie. We got pregnant. We got open, and that's a whole different lecture, okay? So why in the world are we doing this? Our goal is to remove random, because I think random is kind of the enemy of efficient, okay? Well, what's random? Random is you got a bull that you that has low accuracy EPDs, and we turn him out with our set of cows, and we just get whatever he gives us, right? Okay, well, how is Bart making money? Bart is making money by selling steers in August. These are fall-born, backgrounded, 
eight weight steers. So if that's what he's doing, let's make steers. Okay? So we're going to use sex sorted semen on everything. For his replacement heifers, we'll throw a little bit of female in there, but that's just for his heifers. All of his cows are going to get male semen, male dom or male sorted semen, so that we can get 80 to 85% of his cow, his calf crop to be steers. Okay? We've been hitting around 60% conception rates. His steers are worth about $300 more. And that makes him more money. Because if we're going to stick a straw in and bark, we may as well stick a straw in that's going to make us money, right? Okay, and steers are worth more in bark system than heifers. All right, that's enough on the product. How do we reduce costs? How do we right size cows per, per, for profit? Again, I just want to throw up there that it's production compared to costs, and our main cost is feed. I think Jim has something or, uh, later on where about 60% of, of the feed of our costs are feed costs. Cow weight and milking ability dictate the amount and the quality of feed that's necessary, right, Dr. Lim Cooler? Okay. And our objective is to get equal product or maybe slightly more out of less, less cow, less feed, fewer inputs, equal or slightly more product. Beef industry's changed quite a bit and I, I just throw this up there for nostalgia. That's my dad, that's the grand champion shorthorn steer at the North American, which was in Chicago back in the, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, that's a heifer, that's the steer. Um, he won the champion steer both times there, but my dad is a little bit shorter than me, so figure out how tall the champion shorthorn heifer was back in the late 1950s. <laughs> then we figured out something else, right? All right, we saw all these big breeds over in, uh, in, in, in Europe and decided we needed to get more weight. So we went to the other extreme. Well, we did that because it's a pounds of beef world. Always has been, likely, always will be. Weaning weight or market weight has dictated, for the most part, our ability to generate revenue. Few, three lines of research that I know of that shows for every 100 pounds of cow weight, we get either seven, somewhere between 7 and 31 pounds of weaning weight. If you're sitting at the 31 pounds of weaning weight, that's not too bad. At 7 pounds, man, you're not very efficient. Yielding weight, of course, for those of you that, uh, that do freezer beef and, and sell off the hoof at, at, at harvest, um, that's pretty important, and if you're doing... Uh, grid marketing, carcass weight is, is another major impactor on revenue. What it boils down to is how much are we feeding those cows because it is a pounds of beef world and for us to get more pounds, typically we need bigger cows. Well, bigger cows cost more. Bigger cows eat more. This 1,600 pound cow eats about a ton more feed a year on a dry matter basis as a 1,200-pound cow, a ton more feed. So how much does a ton of feed cost today, Dr. Lim Cooler? Too much. Okay, so our calves, I mean, just to break even, if it's, if it's a ton more feed, they've got to, we got to get enough out of that calf to cover at least that ton of extra feed, right? How are we going to get there? How are we going to reduce our inputs and maintain our pro production? Our best tools are genetic selection and culling. We can get there with natural service. You have to identify a seed stock producer that emphasizes efficiency. We have several in the state. There are many throughout the country that emphasize efficiency. Get a hold of those producer, seed stock producers and commit to their breeding programs. You got to commit to heavy culling. 
That was one of our keys, right, Bart? When we got rid of what didn't work and we replaced it with something that would work, all of a sudden, guess what? It works. And then you would have to commit to a long term because with natural service, it just takes longer to make those changes. We could use synchronization and AI, but the reason to do that is AI, you can use proven genetics, which allows the genetic change to occur at a faster rate. So if you're not patient, like me and David, we're not patient, okay? We want to use AI. There's less risk, it's, it, it's pretty easier, and you get much faster change. Two things about synchronization and AI. Synchronization is a repro deal. That's me. You can synchronize and AI whatever, however you get them pregnant, there's going to be a benefit. AI is a, is a, is a genetics deal. And we really need to separate the two, and there, there are two impacts of this, of this protocol. Synchronization is the short-term impact. AI is a long-term impact, and that's the, where we can really get into right-sizing our cows. In the short term, is it profitable? Cliff Lamb, about 2,000 or 1,200 cows, both groups on each farm. The cows that were exposed to fixed time to AI, fixed time to AI before natural service, weaned more a higher percentage of cow, calves and they were older and older calves way more, right? They made about $50 a cow. We ran the same thing at Jerry Frames, and we got about $70 a cow. Can we use this to become more efficient? What's the long-term impact of the AI component? Data is very difficult, difficult to collect, so we, just, we did a long-term project on two farms. We use maternally oriented genetics because of our environment. We had a limited labor and limited nutrient supply. This has sort of changed a little bit on these farms, but the labor part hasn't. And we tried to match our genetics with our marketing plan. We use crossbreeding, fixed time to AI, natural service, and again, heavy culling. Our goal was to increase the pounds of calf wean per cow exposed and increase decreased mature weights, and increased reproductive efficiency. This is where we started. The average farmer was doing a pretty good job with his reproductive efficiency, but his percent body weight weaned per cow exposed was really low. The large farm was even worse. The average farm started off with just under 1,800 pound cows. We started heavy culling and replacing, and now they're around 1,370 to 1,400 pounds. You're like, oh, well, that's still too big, and you're right. Cattle calve in the fall, they're over-conditioned because they calve in the fall. Biologically, they're a little bit under, uh, uh, right at or under 1,300 pounds uh, in a body condition score five, but... That's as, that's as low as we've been able, to, been able to get them to go. The larger farm started off at 1575 and have gotten to the same point. While cow weight is going down, calf productivity and reproductive efficiency is going up. Pounds of calf wean per cow exposed increased pretty dramatically on both farms. The percent body weight weaned per cow exposed, so percent body weight, 1,200 pound cow weaned in the 600 pound calf is 50%. Divide that by the number of cows that you expose to the bull, and that's percent body weight weaned per cow exposed, increased 10 to 15% in both herds. So pounds are going up, and efficiency is going up. Okay? Two to 400 pound decrease in cow size, which is about three quarters to a ton of less feed per year per cow. Increased pounds of calf weaned per cow exposed by over 100 pounds. And our percent body weight weaned increased 10 to 15%. One other advantage is that since these cows were smaller and we had the same resource, each of these people have expanded their operations. And we've expanded each herd about 20%, and that's added revenue per acre 
of about 30 additional pounds of product. Efficiency is key. Hopefully I didn't bother you too much there with that. This is a story of Bart. I tell this all the time. I throw this up because this is my favorite quote ever in extension. Okay? My time is worth more than money. Now I make twice as much and spend half the time. You get to hear from Bart later. I hope I didn't put any pressure on him. Ray, that's it. Happy to answer any questions if we've got a second. A pro Great question. Steer male semen, I keep saying steer, they're, they're not making steers yet. Um, <laughs> male semen is the exact same cost as conventional. Heifer semen is about 20% higher. Okay? And almost all the people that I deal with want steers. And so it's the same cost. The real issue with gender sorted semen at the beginning was our conception rates weren't acceptable. And now they are. And, and actually, we, we work considerably with these companies. And in a few years, it's going to be at the exact same level as conventional. And so getting, taking the random won't even cost you more. It's a great question. Thank you. I, yeah, that's an incredible question. The question was how much more efficiency if we could take it down to 1,100. I want to take it down to 11 to 1,200. It's really hard to find semen, commercially available semen, that's been sorted that will get us down there. I mean, I, 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 it's a cop-out, but it's, it's the truth. I mean, we're using, we were using bulls that are supposed to take us there and there, we're falling short about 100, 150 pounds. Well, we might have to switch breeds. Um, and certainly on the maternal end, we will because, you know, there's a problem, okay, is because the semen companies have to sell semen, and they're selling semen on different types biological types than, than what than what we really need. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I mean, they, they've got to sell semen and, you know, they don't, they don't, we don't have too many options for moderate cow size. Really difficult, actually. And that's, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not blaming it. I mean, it's just a, it is just a fact of the industry is, is they will sell more semen with other genetics than what, Really, but we've been trying to figure out how to get around that. That's a, that's a really good question. Let's give Les a big hand.